I'm a solo dev making an open world immersive sim. This devlog accounts for nearly an entire year of working on and off. Sometime around the end of August 2020, I started working on a little prototype. I named the Unity Project 1960s Spy. It took me about five days to get a little thing up and running, something for my friends to play, to give me some feedback on. It's insane looking back at now, seeing how far the game has come. It has a name now. Memories of a Spy. A title I gave it back when the design was also very different from how it started, and even from what it is now. It's been a real evolution, a refinement. Designs come and go, I build them up and tear them down. The version a lot of people remember was the one I did most of my development streams on. The one with all the crazy NPC stuff. That's when I actually had some core game loops down. A lot of the systemic bits were coming together, but in October of 2021, I made a new Unity project, this time in HDRP, and started building the game from scratch. The only thing that I was keeping was the assets, but the programming was getting a complete overhaul. So let's go over what's happened since then, considering that happened right after the last devlog came out about a year ago. As I mentioned in the last devlog, I'd been inspired by Brendan Chung's advice to polish as you go. So my process is very not recommended. What I do is I polish as I go, and I'll make every art final as I'm gray boxing. When you put in final art as quickly as you humanly can, it forces you to make these decisions. All right, I put in a final uh, art uh, barrel here. Now I need to figure out, you know, why is this barrel here? And now I need to find, put in this next art asset that justifies this barrel. And then that kind of snowballs out to other thing. And then before you know it, the level is done. <laughs> it's easy to say generally that this is bad advice. But for some people, this just works and is really the way to go. For where Memories of a Spy was at that point, I was ready to do that. To just finalize all of my art assets, or at least as much of it as I can for the most important assets, specifically the world. I promised myself to not touch Unity, to just stay in Blender until I was done modeling and texturing all six cities of the game. And that's what I did. I got serious with a spreadsheet to start listing off all the things that I needed to model, and before I started modeling, I would first find all of the needed reference images. This was one of the best decisions I ever made on this project. Organizing that spreadsheet with all the references really put into perspective how important a good workflow is. And those were some pretty fun streams too. The research for that stuff can be some of the most fascinating parts of game dev. Small decorative barrel. It was during this time that some people approached me offering to help with the asset creation, specifically with modeling. The first collaborator I worked with helped model some of the bathroom assets and other miscellaneous furniture. And although the work was short-lived, it was incredibly fulfilling to have some kind of companionship, to be working as a team, however modestly, as opposed to the solo venture this has been for the last couple of years. And then nearly around the same time, I started work with another collaborator, Josh. He also reached out and offered to help, and also went on to model props and furniture. Working with these people was great. We were very often on the same page. I rarely, if ever, had any notes to adjust or change things. They just kind of nailed it the first time around. Having a reference image with a couple of notes can make the process easy and clear. I would then take their models, UV unwrap them, and texture them. I also set up a system so we could make sure we weren't modeling the same thing twice by entering our name next to the item on the spreadsheet only once we started modeling it. Once the world was done, it was time to get a new project up and running to drop those assets into. I decided to start a new project for the sake of tidiness. That 1960 spy project was getting unwieldy, filled with assets I was testing but didn't use, and using a folder structure that had gone through several organizations dating back to the original prototype. With all my lessons learned and better grasp on the direction of the project, I would be able to organize things a lot better. I also felt it important to choose my render pipeline when creating the project, instead of going through the hassle of switching pipelines mid-project. In the end, I chose HDRP because it offered a lot of novel settings that just aren't available in the other pipelines. Even for simple things like decals, you need hacky third-party solutions for other pipelines, but it just comes out of the box for HDRP. The first thing I started doing in the project 
project was online multiplayer. I wanted to know exactly what I was going to be doing for networking every time I designed a feature or mechanic. The Memories of a Spy multiplayer would work similar to Left 4 Dead's multiplayer, in that every campaign is given a set of characters, no matter the player count, but they are NPCs. And then when a player joins, they are assigned control over one of those characters so that the character is no longer an NPC. When the player leaves or is disconnected, the character turns back into an NPC. I got this up and running with some simple cubes at first. They would spin by default if they were NPCs, and then they would stop spinning if a player took control of them, and the player could hit the space bar to make them jump. This worked out well, so I set up a version with the actual character prefabs. Syncing position, rotation, and animations was a breeze, as Pun2 offers some plug-and-play components for that. I also slapped some components on objects in the world to control rigid body stuff. And then I ran a little stress test with a group of friends. It was a chaotic, buggy mess, and it was a lot of fun. To be clear, I fully expected this stress test to break the game. I wanted to see exactly where things were breaking so I can understand networking better. This was a great learning experience. And not too long after did I begin to understand the limitations of Pun2 with a simulation style game. Memories of a Spy is basically a fully simulated world. It's very systemic, and many things need to be running at once even when the player is not observing them. Because of that, I needed to throw in the towel for Pun2. I had some meetings with Jean Fabre, and after getting a better understanding of my networking needs, he pointed me in the direction of Photon Fusion. Theoretically, I could get the network version of Memories of a Spy running as long as I could create some kind of integration with Playmaker. I was warned that, though possible, that it would be a lot of difficult work. So I ran some tests, I built some samples with Fusion, saw the mind-blowing power it has, and then concluded that this was not a challenge I was ready to take on. And this was the point I decided to drop multiplayer support. Where I stand currently is, I will be moving forward on Memories of a Spy development as a single player game. I am still very open and excited about making it multiplayer, and will still totally do it if one of the following happens. Sales for the single player version are significant enough for me to go full time on it, or if a publisher or whatever kind of money comes along and again gives me the resources to go full time on it, or someone offers to do it themselves pending terms of a contract we can agree on, or just on a long enough timeline despite poor sales, I just have the interest to do it myself on my free time over the course of a thousand years. In other words, let's make sure launch day murders, so go wishlist Memories of a Spy now, link in the description. Go ahead, just like, like pause it for a second or whatever. Okay, so back to the development stuff. The one thing I was excited about making was the singular character prefab, and nesting all the FSMs into empty game objects, which serve as categories. So I have my game object for player FSMs, and I have my game object for NPC FSMs. And then under the player game object is a controls game object for all the FSMs dealing with control. Even without multiplayer, I plan on experimenting with features that allow the player to swap controls over to another NPC, giving their current character over to be controlled by an NPC. The other thing I'm pretty happy with here is that there is a category for character sims, which is where I put the FSMs that handle simulations the same way regardless of whether it's a human player or an NPC. Things like health, clothes, poisons, etc. This way I don't have to program any redundancies. The old interaction system had a pretty weird way of working. I built it back when I didn't know how to use events between systems, so I relied on bulls and bull tests. Basically every item was waiting in a state with a bull test checking the value every frame and when the player would interact with it they would set the bull to true the bull variable was named something like is interacting or something like that then when the interaction was complete the bull would get set back to false it's very hacky very amateur very inefficient eventually i was using events but there was still a lot left to be desired to make things a little bit more streamlined and templatable in the last days of working in the old project i was starting to finally learn how to use fsm templates but still had much to learn so now with tons of experience using fsm templates and having made a bunch of learning resources for Hutong which utilized this interact event, Memories of a Spy would now have my best attempt for a generic and uniform 
universal interaction system. This is where I started developing the object FSM template, which is used as an intermediary for interaction with all items. There's a handful of values I could set as input variables, so I could hand code unique properties into every object while still keeping the fundamental inner workings. Objects have bool values that I can tick to say whether or not they're interactable, equipable, grabbable, and whether or not they can have things stashed inside of them. For example, a plate should be grabbable. I guess it could be equipable, so you can hide it in your shirt or something. It's not really interactable because basically the function of a plate is to put things on top of it. And it should most definitely not allow things to be stashed inside of it since a plate should basically be one solid mass. There isn't some inner space of a plate to put things inside of. Primary functions of objects are executed when the player just taps the interact button. And secondary functions of objects are executed when the player holds the interact button. But the secondary functions are only available to objects which aren't grabbable. Otherwise, holding interact would grab an object. This is also the point where I got my hands on Final IK and introduced some simple procedural animations. Firstly, the character rig rotates its head and back when the player is looking up and down, but also so that when the player reaches for something to interact with it or to stash something or to pull something out of a stash, the hand and arm will reach directly for the item. This looks especially cool when the item is on the floor, kind of looks like the player is trying to be sneaky, kind of like if you're trying to do a handoff without being noticed, or when you're trying to be sneaky when you're stealing something. Some other input variables on the object FSM are arrays. One is for strings, this is called the surface substance string array, and the other is for floats, called the surface substance amounts array. This is where I write in what kind of substances can be found on the surface of that object, and how much of that substance there is. For example, a door might have paint chips, and a croissant might have bread flakes. The system was pretty easy to implement and has proved to be one of the more exciting and promising systems so far. It opens up all sorts of fun things to do with cluing you into who has been where and touched what, literally a breadcrumb trail. It also opens up a feature I've been dying to implement since the early days of drafting ideas for the game loop, poisons and allergies. Having the surface substance system in place also gives so much more value to the sinks and water sources in the game. It was a breeze adding a wash hands feature to the sinks, which scrubs the player's hands of all surface substances. After surface substances were done, I was able to jump into consumables. This system had to be built for all the things that the player would be intentionally and unintentionally consuming. The system accounts for how much energy certain foods should give you, if they have anything you're allergic to, and if they have any poison. And then of course the system processes everything and shoots it out the other end. There are values for waste, and I never got as far to implement the actual animations and functions for taking a shit or taking a piss, but the system did have everything leading up to that, including some diminished traces of whatever the person consumed. So whenever I get around to adding the part where you can actually shit or piss, the poop game object would contain traces of whatever that person ate. Developing the poison system logic was something I figured out in great detail a long time ago, and I had been waiting to finally implement it. Again, one of those systems that just came together and worked right away. Every character starts with a baseline for what their lethal dose is, so if they ingest poison in an amount equal or greater than that baseline, they die. But if they consume less than a lethal dose, they just get very sick, but they live. Then once the poison has finished processing and they're over their symptoms, they get a buff so they can now tolerate a higher dose of poison. This way characters can build a tolerance to poison. It's at a cost, but at small enough doses, it may be worth it in the end. They may be thanking themselves when that day comes when someone tries poisoning them. The tolerance, however, also is on a constant decline back to the default. So maintaining a tolerance to poison requires a habit of microdosing. Poisoning triggers a random set of symptoms, fainting, vomiting, and diarrhea. Figuring out the vomiting particle system was fun, so the player starts barfing everywhere and the particles get on everything. It's, you know, it's pretty fun. The fainting and diarrhea are still just empty states that don't manifest in any way yet. Or, or maybe the fainting does, but uh, yeah, I'll get to that soon enough. The way your inventory works in Memories of a Spy is based on the clothes you wear. If you're completely naked, you can only be carrying two things, one in each hand. But you can also carry something in your mouth and up your ass. Each item of clothing you wear gives you inventory space relative to that item of clothing. So for example, wearing underwear will give you room for some small items, but pants will give you more. Then wearing a shirt will give you more room, 
and a jacket yet more. So when you're fully clothed, you should have room for a nice little inventory. To get this system up and running, I first needed to build the stashing system, which allows you to put items into other items. Then I need to build the clothing system, which allows you to put individual articles of clothing on. Then I can build the inventory system, which essentially is just a screen that allows the player to view the contents of the clothes that they're currently wearing. So I started with stashing. The inventory system allows you to put most objects inside of each other. In the previous version, this meant I would hard code an arbitrary size value, an integer, which would be compared to other objects to see if one object could be fit into the other. This was a pain in the ass because I had to commit to a scale with an arbitrary standard, which meant that somewhere down the line, if I wanted new items which were bigger or smaller than what used to be the biggest or smallest, I would have to rework the math. So I decided to make use of the bounds of my game objects and use that as a metric for deciding whether or not an object could fit into another. At first I was merely checking if the scale on each axis was greater than the object attempting to be stashed inside. So if I was trying to put a cigarette inside of a camera, I would check, well, is the x-axis of this camera wider than the x-axis of this cigarette? How about the Y? How about the Z? And it would check each of those independently to make sure that the object can fit in at some rotation. However, I didn't like the solutions I was coming up with to dictate how much space was then occupied once you did stash something, because you know, you can't just keep shoving a bunch of things into something just because they're smaller. Like eventually the actual space occupied means you shouldn't be able to put anything else in. Things should be able to fill up. So finally I decided to ditch the bit about checking the scale of each axis and instead on initialization every object would get the volume of its bounds and then use that volume when stashing itself into other things as well as when other things were being stashed inside of it. This gave a much more reliable system that sort of solved itself. It can give some really silly results when trying to stash something very wide and flat into something not as wide, but maybe has more volume because of a single axis. Like you can imagine a really long, thin pole. The volume of that super long, thin pole might be bigger than the volume of a bowling ball. But you shouldn't be able to put a bowling ball inside of that pole. So there, there are a few weird things that happen. Still, it's a system that yields more intuitive results without having to give it too much more work. Next, I moved on to the clothing system. Like nearly everything else in Memories of a Spy, clothes are represented by physical objects in the game world. So I made a model for each general type of clothing. A folded up upper body object, which would be used for shirts and jackets. Then a folded up lower body object for pants and shorts and dresses. Then a pair of underwear, which could be used exclusively for underwear and maybe someday for bikini bottoms. Items. I then gave these objects the object FSM template used for stashing, so I could now put things inside of these clothes. Then I gave the clothes functionality so that when you use them, they equip themselves to your body. Now there's a ton of crazy logic here because essentially they are just applying materials onto the single character mesh. And when you stack materials, it gives the illusion of a fully dressed character. Under the hood, there are other things going on for each of the colliders on the character's bodies and limbs. With stashing and clothing done, I was able to move on to the inventory system. Essentially, all inventory had to do was display the contents of each article of clothing, but it also had to display the contents of whatever object the player was examining. I've been pretty against the idea of having traditional UI elements, little boxes with images of the items and all that, numbers and text everywhere, so the inventory menu I built reflected something that required less of that, and instead relied on a simple control scheme and hopefully felt pretty intuitive. What I ended up with was a pretty straightforward logic that resembled your basic operating system like Windows or Mac OS. You click and drag objects around and you drag them on top of other objects to put them inside of that object. If you just click on the object, you go into its contents. You can see its contents displayed. If you drag the object away from its slot and then drop it on nothing, it removes itself from the inventory altogether and then drops in front of the player outside of this menu. This all worked nearly automatically with the clothing system. Clicking on an article of clothing would then display all the objects currently stashed away in it. The additional functionality I gave it was so that clothing could be treated the same way as objects in this menu. That meant that you could click and drag the clothes off of a player 
you could also click and drag clothes on the player as well. Last Halloween, I got together with the boys to record some of the music for Memories of a Spy. The music that would be played on the in-game radios, available on vinyl from the record shops in London, and performed live at the bar in Paris. I had a blast writing all of the lyrics. Sonny and Ben were on guitar and vocals. Cameron was on vocals. And between all of them, they kind of all sorted out the compositions. And I just kind of gave notes on stuff, but basically they brought it all together. And then Cameron took it home and mixed it and added some additional stuff. And it's, I, I, I fucking, I love it. I, I, I love, I listen to these all the time. Uh, so here are some samples from each of the tracks. My, oh my, there he goes. The man whose face never shows. He's here one moment, not the next. He's right behind me. He's got my neck. Projects. I'm using Master Audio AAA Sound. It has great playmaker integration, and even in the process of developing this radio broadcast system, the team over at Dark Tonic Inc. was very accommodating and communicative when I was looking for solutions. They even ended up adopting and tweaking a custom action I wrote to include in their playmaker integration. The way radios work in Memories of Spy is like this. There is a broadcast that comes from each city, which plays its own selection of music. Basically, you should expect to hear the music mostly in the language spoken in that city. All radios in the same city need to be playing the same thing in sync. That's the nature of a broadcast. There's no pausing the radio. So you could turn them on and off, but that's the limit of their functionality. The radios can be taken between cities too, so they're set up to play whatever's broadcasting from the closest city. This means that you can take a radio from Moscow to DC, and somewhere on the plane ride, it'll stop playing Russian music and instead start playing American music. And the radios are pretty simple in that way right now 
now, but with their design as it stands, it should be relatively easy to add new features like emergency news broadcasts and additional stations per city, so maybe at some point you can tune into a station for your favorite genre of music, classical, jazz, pop, etc. There's a post-processing volume that starts to increase its weight in relation to how low the player health goes, so the lower the health goes, the more intense the dying effects take over, which is a narrow field of view, more distorted lens, black and white, grainy, and with higher contrast, that makes the player vision less and less clear. And then on death, Ragdoll kicks in and the player loses control. Because a major aspect of Memories of a Spy is language, and the way it's used as code switching, I had to start sorting out a system that would allow non-speakers of language to get a translation while still preserving the original language and giving the player the option to turn off translations. So the idea was to have both closed captions and subtitles. Closed captions being the text on screen displaying transcripts of the language being spoken. Subtitles being the text on screen displaying a translated transcript from the language you don't speak into the language you do speak. So ideally the player would have the option to turn either of those on and off independently. This gives rise to something I've been looking forward to for a long time as well. The real world ability for a player to learn small bits of languages. You can play Memories of a Spy as someone who only speaks English and over time pick up on the other languages enough to play without subtitles on and just really listen in and understand the character speaking. Like how badass would that feel? I got a prototype of this up and running, a little world filled with characters saying random things in randomly chosen languages. The system I was trying out here was one that would display closed captions and subtitles for the closest speaking character to the player. I'm still not 100% about this feature, but I think with an eavesdrop button that the player can toggle or maybe press and point at while looking at someone and then look away, but still display the dialogue. Something like that might work. There's a lot of ways to do this. I'm still playing with it. Because as I mentioned, the languages thing is mostly about code switching, making sure that you're always speaking the language that you're expected to speak. Otherwise, you risk giving yourself away as a foreigner or imposter when you end up speaking in a language the person listening is not expecting you to speak. This is a pretty deep rabbit hole, but I think there's a nice video gamey, simple way to do this that will feel organic and fun. After testing a handful of procedurally generated level assets, like dungeon builder kind of assets, I finally landed on one that was simple enough and did everything I needed it to do. F impossible or FIM possible's procedural generation grid. And there are some things that kind of bug me because it's still in development and the documentation is decent but not super thorough, which is expected since it's in development. But for some reason, I just haven't been able to fully wrap my head around it. I've, I've gotten some of the bare minimum I've needed out of it, but being able to repeat that has been difficult. The dev monitoring their support discord just got married and is going to be away for a short while. So at the time of me writing this, I haven't spoken to them about these things yet, but hopefully I'll get my questions answered soon so I could bring this feature to the finish line you know it's it's very close to being done but yeah so far I've been able to procedurally generate the labyrinth that is the lower levels of the intelligence agency headquarters and I'm using easy save as my save system so when the player saves the game during a session the seed for the procedurally generated agency is preserved you wouldn't want a new agency every time you loaded your game only when you start a new one somewhere in the middle of all this I also prototyped the procedurally generated movies to play at the theater in Berlin it's a pretty straightforward process, but it does drop the frame rate a little bit. Not exactly sure how manageable it'll be in practice when there's more going on with it, but yeah, currently it's not that big of a deal. It's been so long since I've touched the AI stuff, which is just my favorite part of building Memories of the Spy. One of the first things I did when beginning work on this new version of the AI system was to go out and buy my Cosmos Sensor Toolkit 2. I'm a huge fan of the first Sensor Toolkit and have used it extensively. Just like the first one, this one has lots of great Playmaker integration. I haven't got much up and running with this just yet, but I've got the basic setup. In the last project, my AI FSMs were really adding up, and Unity does not like having tons of components on a single game object. So this time around, I made sure to categorize all the various AI FSMs by their character type and whether or not 
the behaviors were unique to that character or if they were universally used by all NPCs. Another recent addition is the character controller. For a long time I've been using Unity's character controller component and it's been okay this far. I've used it on plenty of other projects as well and it's good. Just quick, get it up and running, works fine. But there are a handful of limitations that I've been surprised to find, particularly with moving platforms. For all the wacky shit I want to do with my controller, it was about time I turned to the asset store for a thorough solution. A friend had recently said some good things about an asset called Easy Character Movement. So I picked it up, did some tests, and have now integrated it with my character prefab. It worked pretty immediately, though I can imagine needing some more customization when I want to control it more with Playmaker, as there isn't any native Playmaker integration. I've also made a pretty fundamental change to the interaction system. Hold opens up a small UI listing the additional interact features specific to that object. I was inspired by Project Zomboid, which has this interface that looks kind of like an operating system with its many windows and being largely text-based. And so with this, I have templates that I've built that make it easy for me to now give objects many levels of interaction. I can easily add or remove options their buttons without having to tear everything apart. I think this marks the beginning of my shift away from the design philosophy I used to hold about not having a bunch of boring text and boxes everywhere. And while I still don't want some messy and boring UI, I believe there are some intuitive, friendly, and good feeling ways to approach that traditional UI stuff while still maintaining some of the in-world diegetic interaction that I used to strive for entirely. The thing I need to figure out here is a guideline for my designs. When do I use this list of buttons? When do I make it in-world like the knob on a radio? And when do I do the in-between like a UI with a 2D representation of the knob on a radio? One thing I really wanted to talk about was how I've been finding Memories of a Spy. And what I want to say up front is that Memories of a Spy, while I hope it is one of the most unique experiences someone can have in this world, I also know it rests on the shoulders of its predecessors, and that it no doubt takes inspiration from other games, whether I'm conscious of it or not. That being said, there still isn't a game quite like it, and I've looked far and wide. It isn't even a game like it, because Memories of a Spy doesn't actually exist yet. Memories of a Spy is a child I'm raising, and I'm doing everything I can to raise it to be a good person, an interesting person person, a remarkable person, but it will make its own way. It will say what's best for it. Those things will change as time goes on, and I can only hope to give it some guiding principles. There aren't any rule books for the kind of game I want to make, so I don't have rules to follow, I don't have rules to bend, and I don't have rules to break. I'm writing the rules. What I end up needing to do is researching how one game did this aspect, how another game did that aspect, how another game did this other thing, blah, 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 blah. But it's not like making a clone where I can just look at one or two games and then just do that, but with my own art assets. And what I found is that I spend a ton of time planning in my Trello board, my OneNote pages, and sketching in my notebook. I spend significantly more time thinking through the design than I do actual programming. Now, of course, you do need to eventually hit the pavement and see things working, prototype things to see how they feel, and I do. But I found that actually when I'm imagining things and figuring it out on paper, when I build and test an idea that I felt iffy and unsure on, playing it does feel iffy and it's slower to work through those problems because now I actually have to make it real as I think it through. But when I figure out something on paper and I feel good about it, and then I build and test it, playing it does feel good. I think this is one of the skills I'm most proud of, is knowing when an idea is ready for prototyping. And if you've been on my streams, think about all the times I've sat there deliberating the idea before jumping into programming it. Or even similarly, the times I've been in the middle of programming and then suddenly I have to account for a design concept I didn't anticipate. Getting the thing out on paper as much as you can is one of the best things you can do for a game. Because no matter what, there are going to be unforeseen design questions. The only time there aren't unforeseen design questions are when you're making a clone. When you're just making your favorite game with different art. I remember watching an interview with Warren Spector where he talks about this. What he enjoys is treading you around. In solving a problem, people haven't taken a crack at yet. Even if the problem is just a combination people haven't tried yet. I guess I would define a failure as executing really well against a well-understood problem. There are plenty of publishers uh, and plenty of developers, more to the point, uh, who do that really, really well. I mean, they, they take 
ideas that other people have pioneered or that other people have, have shown that, uh, the potential of. And then what they do is they, they take those ideas and they execute against them better than the people who created them. And I would probably kill myself before I did that. I just have no interest. If, if I already know how to do something, why would I do it again? And I feel that big time. It's a bittersweet thing because on one hand, there's no feeling like it. And honestly, like Spectre, I can't bring myself to polish pre-existing ideas. But also, you have to wade through the waters of uncertainty. And that can be stressful at times, especially when you wish you could just see the light at the end of the tunnel. For example, a big design philosophy I have to wrestle with constantly in Memories of a Spy is the whole diegetic, non-diegetic thing, like I mentioned with the UI, that extends into all sorts of things other than inventory and items. Take poisons, for example, that whole thing about building a tolerance. That's a very specific thing, a balancing act with numbers. How the hell am I supposed to illustrate that to the player without putting actual numbers on the screen? With health, you could beat the player up and it's pretty clear how low the health is when it gets all black and white and distorted. You know you're gonna die. You don't need a little number in the corner to tell you that. But with the poison, you might go into other mechanics so it becomes measurable, say by only being able to dispense poison one drop at a time. And maybe putting a lethal dose number on the label of a bottle like three drops equals lethal dose. But then once your tolerance goes up, you have to figure out how to keep track of that because now your personal lethal dose is higher. I've thought about making an item the player can use that's like a blood test and it can give you stats like what your current lethal dose is. But you can see how taking these systems that are happening under the hood, these spreadsheets, and giving them something observable and measurable to the player without putting yet another number on screen, how that can be a slippery slope of a challenge. I would like to come up with amazing answers for every one of these design problems, but I do also want to do other things with my life. I've gone months without working on Memories of a Spy, after long stints of working non-stop on it. Because I think if I really looked at it like it was a full-time job, I probably spent less than eight months working on it over the last two years. So anyways, if you dig what I'm doing, and you want to help out, check out the links in the description. Wishlist the game for sure. If you're interested in game dev, check out Playmaker if you haven't already. My affiliate link is in the description, so if you buy Playmaker using that, I get a little commission. That helps. And if you're learning Playmaker, be sure to check out my game dev courses. I made one for a 2D physics-based Metroidvania, and I made one for a first-person horror game. And if you didn't know, I'm the guy that makes the official Playmaker tutorials. So you can rest assured that you're learning some really solid stuff. Even as a total beginner, you'll be taken up to intermediate. Also, just saying what's up in the comments, dropping a like and subscribing and all of that legitimately helps put my channel on other people's radar. So I appreciate the hell out of that. Okay, thanks everyone. Swing by the Discord, say what's up. Stay tuned for some dev streams coming up. Yeah.